Good day. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day and welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by American Jewish Committee. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. The past year was challenging for many Jewish students on college campuses, in high schools, and even elementary and middle schools. As the new academic year approaches, what efforts are underway to ensure that they can learn in school environments free from anti-Semitism and intimidation? What resources are available to them? And what approach is the U.S. Department of Education taking? Here to answer these questions and more is Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education, Cindy Martin. Moderating our conversation is Dr. Laura Shawfrank, Director of the AJC Center for Education Advocacy. After we hear from our guest, time permitting, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at ajc.org, questions is plural, or you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And Deputy Secretary Martin, I'm so honored to be in conversation with you today. I know you know, but I would like to tell our audience that we at AJC so deeply value our close relationship with the Department of Education. Your guidance is invaluable to us, and it really allows us to give very tangible and digestible advice to Jewish students and, and parents, as well as our interlocutors in educational spaces. So thank you so much for being here. I'm going to dive right in because we have so much we want to cover with you today. So let's begin with a 30,000 foot question about how the Department of Education engages with educational institutions, whether it's K through 12 or institutions of higher ed. So first K through 12, we all know that public school systems are inherently local. They're overseen by state and local governments and school boards and private or independent schools are far less subject to governmental oversight than public schools. And then there's higher ed, which can be public or private and can also be subject to state or local government laws and regulations. So this is a really messy legal and oversight space landscape. And yet the problems we face are so significant and they really scream for federal engagement. So given all those realities, how does the Department of Education see its role in combating anti-Semitism and actually really all forms of hate in schools? Thank you for opening with a 30,000 foot question and getting right into the how, because as a lifelong educator, I'm always trying to unpack the how. I like to get past admiring the problem and wringing our hands, what should we do? And you're right, it's screaming for engagement here. And you and I just met right before we started, we already decided we're gonna go have coffee together because we're lifelong educators and teachers. So I bring that to this space and leading as a deputy secretary here at the Department of Education alongside Secretary Cardona, who's also a lifelong educator. We bring that to the work. And I'm glad in your question and framing, you outlined this idea about K-12 public school system being incredibly local, quite frankly, as they should be. And yet there needs to be federal support, guidance and enforcement. And that to understand between K-12 and higher ed, where are the lines and what can we do and what should we do and what are we able to do and what are we required to do is like you said, it's kind of messy, but like any good kindergarten teacher, we like a mess, we can get right through it and get straight to the core of it. So I'm bringing my personal story here just a little bit in how I go forward. Um, I spent 17 years as a classroom teacher. My first seven years of teaching were at a private Jewish day school in San Diego. That's my background. I'll just go ahead and let you know, I'm actually in San Diego right now, visiting my mother who's 86 years old and has been very involved in the Jewish community here in San Diego her whole life. She was president of our local temple. She was the president of Jewish Family Services here in San Diego. And I almost made her put on like hair and makeup to join the call because I said, I'm going to be talking to Jewish friends and families all across the country and I was going to make her come over here on camera, but she didn't want to do that. So She's very high. She doesn't always know all the things that I do at the federal level, because like you just said, it's messy and it's hard to understand, yet the problems are so significant. So when I talk to my mom about what this call is about and what we're able to do, having it make sense and having it like, what do you actually do to make a difference within the authorities that you have? We have the U.S. national strategy to counter anti-Semitism from the Department of Education at the federal level. It's actually the Department of Education's role in in is just one government agency. It is a national strategy led by the White House and every agency has work 
to do in delivering on this national strategy. And that came out in May of 2023. And so the Department of Education's role in that, we launched an anti-Semitism awareness campaign in May of 2023, and, and or it came out in May of 2023. We launched the campaign in September of 2023, just two weeks before the October before October 7th. And I was able to visit San Francisco when we launched the strategy as role in that. I was with students, fourth grade students at the uh, J Jewish Art Museum. And so that was something that we were very proactive in doing. And then since then, like two weeks right after we launched this national strategy that I'm so proud of this administration for doing, we've had to only intensify our work. And we've done that through enforcement in our Office of Civil Rights and through education through our center of faith-based and neighborhood partnerships. And I've always said, if we only do the enforcement side of this, we're gonna fall short as important and necessary as that is and this moment calls for. If we only do the resources and support side of this, we are going to fall short. We need both and they need to be constantly working together and learning from the field. And I put the teacher hat on all of my years as a classroom teacher and then ultimately a vice principal, a principal and a superintendent in San Diego, I bring to bear on building a, a dynamic, multifaceted approach to the ways in which we can support schools and districts and universities to meet the, the moment that we're in right now. Thank you so much. I, the educator in me, and by the way, I also spent 17 years teaching in Jewish day school. So we have this incredible uh, thing in common. Um, I'm so glad you highlighted the national strategy, which has been such a centerpiece of AJC's work. Um, we highlight it all the time. It's such an excellent strategy and we really strongly recommend it, using it to all of our interlocutors. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Um, I wanna delve more deeply into both of the realms that you just mentioned, enforcement and education. So let's start with enforcement. Last year, as we know, was super challenging in so many educational institutions around the country, as particularly, of course, after, after October 7th. With protests and walkouts, some of them became unruly, disruptive, even violent, and often expressed or at least fostered anti-Semitism. So could you talk a little bit about the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, or as we call it, OCR, and how OCR is investigating schools and higher ed institutions for violations of Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act? And maybe we should start by a little, maybe if you could give us a little explanation of Title VI and how OCR engages in those investigations. Absolutely, and I'll say that this is you should actually, anytime our assistant secretary for our office for civil rights, Catherine Lehman speaks, you should sign up and go to it because this is her life's work. And she is so clear eyed and fierce in the way she does her work and the way she implements. So I am only speaking on behalf of the way she leads this body of work so powerfully at the department and it's her lifelong work and calling. So um, that I am not the civil rights attorney and I'm not the enforcer, but as the deputy secretary, I am proud to represent the fine work of her office and all the work that she does. And she does webinars all the time. I know she interacts with AGC all the time on speed dial. So I will do my best to give it justice so that you understand what we do here in the in terms of the enforcement side. Like I said, if we forget to do the enforcement and all we do is support, as educators, we love to teach, but we must enforce when we need to. So Title VI of the Civil Rights Act specifically prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin, including shared ancestry. And that it prohibits it in programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance. All education institutions, including pre-K, elementary, secondary public schools, school districts, and public and private colleges, universities, and other post-secondary institutions that receive federal financial assistance are required to comply with Title VI. Like that's that's what this is. And so we then go forward with our enforcement through our Office for Civil Rights and discrimination under Title VI can include steps that schools take or fail to take to protect students from harassment on the basis of their race, color, and national origin. And that includes shared ancestry or ethnic characteristics. And we're clear about this. Our Office for Civil Rights can investigate complaints that students are filing, that they were subject, subjected to ethnic or ancestral slurs, when students are harassed for how they look, when students are harassed for how they dress or how they speak. 
in any way that's linked to ethnicity or ancestry, OCR can investigate those complaints. If students are stereotyped based on perceived shared ancestral or ethnic characteristics that's tied to Jewish, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Israeli, Palestinian, Arab, or South Asian identity, among others. That's just part of the whole um, spectrum that we work on. Our Office for Civil Rights passionately, consistently, and vigorously enforces the laws that are within our jurisdiction to protect every student. And we have to do it within the full extent that Congress grants us the authority. So OCR, it, take that context, and now let's talk about what we have done. Our Office for Civil Rights, under our enforcement and fierce protections here, has opened more cases on these topics in this administration than any prior administration, with more than 145 cases that are in investigation today. Wow. Just compare it to the previous administration, they opened 28. We have 145 cases in investigation today compared to 28 in the previous administration. Our Office for Civil Rights has also secured nearly three times as many resolution agreements from schools on these exact topics that I just mentioned than the past administration has secured in all four years. There's been five cases specifically related to post-October 7th complaints that have been resolved so far with all of these that are in investigation. Five have come to a resolution agreement. That's the University of Mich Michigan, SUNY, Lafayette, Brown, and Drexel. And there are more to come. So if you think, look to the Office for Civil Rights, what we've put out through that office is our shared guidance. More than any prior administration, the guidance that we've put out with every federally funded school in the country. And in this guidance, we are very firmly reminding them of their federal legal obligation. It's a legal obligation to protect students' civil rights in this area. And we're putting out this guidance all the time to remind people of that. So then the Office for Civil Rights has also made it easier to report by updating our complaint form. We included specifically addressing anti-Semitism as a form of discrimination that is prohibited under Title VI. And it continues our office continues to provide technical assistance that folks need. So we want to make sure students know their rights and school leaders know their obligations. That's an overview of what this office does in such a fierce and focused way. It's incredible. And I know we've sp spoken with you many, many times about these investigations and how critical they are. Um, we've also seen the results of them and they're incredibly impactful. So now let's turn to what we love. We have to do enforcement, but as you say, um, as two educators here, let's turn to educational resources. What types of educational resources does ED offer, the Department of Education offer to educational institutions, and what do you not offer? Like getting back to that messiness of what's federal, what's state, what's local. So talk to us a little bit about where the Department of Ed sits in that, in the education realm. Trust me, I had to explain it to my mom. Like I'm gonna take this all back to my mom because. I got a Jewish mother proud. I can like get anything right in the world. I say, if you can teach kindergarten and make your mother proud, you can pay, pretty much take on everything. But the idea of the educational resources being core and central to what we're doing, if we don't deliver on the resources, again, we're falling short. And so within the realm of what we can do, and I'll get to what we can't do, because that's what gets confusing for folks, but the Department of Education can specifically fund multiple, what we call technical assistance centers. These are super important because they're a way that we can push out information to the field that make it available to schools and school districts and the institutes of higher education that by funding these technical assistance centers, they can make resources available that will help schools create the safe and supportive learning environments. Because we have great examples across the country of people who are getting it right. There are people who have gone too far off track they find themselves in resolution agreements, they have to figure this out. But before there's even a problem, if you can tap into the technical assistance centers about how to create the safe and supportive learning environments, you're moving forward on the right side of history here. So for example, we've been working closely with, it's called the National Center for Safe Supportive Learning Environments. That's really important website to go to when, we, when you work with that 
National Center for Safe Supportive Learning Environments, you'll see that they've assembled resources that are related specifically to anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and then they can disseminate those to districts across the country. So tap into that resource that is funded through the department. Um, then this summer, we developed and released a new resource guide. We're always coming up with more things, learning from best practices that we've learned in the field. This that school year was upon us. We spent the summer making sure this was ready to go, plug and play. The resource guide is called Free to Learn, Leading Inclusive Learning. We wanted to do that ahead of the coming academic school year. It's upon us now, but we've already released it. The goal for this guide was to make sure that campus leaders have the actual tools that they need to restore the learning environments that were disrupted. And they can also use the toolkit or the resource guide to assess their programs, how are they doing, assess their policies, and look at the systems that they currently have in place so they can guide their institution's response to crises impacting their campus communities and not be on the reactive mode, be proactive, be on the offense rather on the defense. And there's so many great tools in there that campuses can use and folks can read to see what actually works. I wanna point out something super technical in this resource guide because I think it's a leverage point that as advocates and highly engaged members of this community, you might wanna use. It's on the last page of the Free to Learn resource guide. We put a link to the new guidance that we put out that is meant to enhance transparency around hate crimes. People are talking about hate crimes. They're on the rise. We've seen all the data about how they're on the rise. These hate crimes that are happening on campus communities, we want people to know about them. And so this guidance is actually for the institutes of higher education who are already required to track information about hate crimes. This is something that's called the Cleary Act. All institutes of higher education are required to report hate crimes through the Cleary Act. But what this new guidance does is it reminds institutions that be within the Cleary Act reporting guidance, they can voluntarily provide a, additional information beyond what's required that goes out to the members of their campus community. So let me just break that down. Specifically, they can voluntarily specify subcategories of groups that are targeted based on their actual or perceived identity, such as religious or ethnic identity. So what this could look like is it would allow specificity of hate crimes involving anti-Jewish bias. Rather than simply noting hate crimes, which is required based on religion, you can actually drill it down and say hate crimes based on anti-Jewish bias. Let's be specific and talk about the hate crime that is existing on our campus and report it within your Clery Act reporting guidance. We think that this guidance is gonna allow communities to be empowered with more detailed data that I think is incredibly helpful. It will help governments, it will help campus leaders, it will help communities figure out best ways to equip themselves so they can better respond to the types of hate that are affecting different communities in different ways and ensure that all campus, all students are safe on their campuses. And then in putting all of this together, we joined also from a resource perspective, we worked with the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice. We put together a webinar. This is on the resource guide again. We called that Supporting Safe and Resilient Campuses. And that webinar was meant to provide each agency's resources to leaders and staff of institutions of higher education and for campus public safety law enforcement. And that webinar that we just hosted, the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, spoke with the group among other people. And what we did in creating that webinar in, in ahead of the launch of the school year was to make sure that we were giving support before school started and being ahead of the curve there and making sure we're bringing people together so that there's no hand wringing about, we're not sure what to do. Where's the line of free speech and breaking up protests? And we also didn't want people and important stakeholders to figure out where do I go to get answers? Right. Do I go to Homeland Security? Do I go to DOJ? Do I go to the Department of Ed? It shouldn't be on the very people we love and want to serve to figure out where to find us at the federal level. We wanted one-stop shop. We wanted all of us to come together as a federal agency, as a federal family, working together so that the, it's the people we care most about know where to go to get the help that they need. So that, those are the two things that we just put out in, in preparing for the school year. As for what we don't do, there's a lot of things in the domain of state and local government that are left 
to private institutions. There, that's where that's where the authorities sometimes lie. One of the common, most common misconceptions is that here at the Department of Education, we develop and write and disseminate the curriculum that goes out to the schools. We are actually prohibited by Congress from doing that. We can't do that. Believe me, I'm a lifelong teacher in curriculum, right? I would love to do it. That is not what the federal government does. But we can still talk about the value of things like Holocaust education. When I launched the national strategy, it was at a museum and we were talking to the fourth grade teacher about what they were doing within their local context and local curriculum. We can talk about the value of religious literacy. We can talk about the value of ensuring students are able to bring their full selves to the classroom. And we absolutely do all of that in the work that we do. That's such a helpful overview. I, I know I'm I'm personally finding it incredibly helpful and I know that our audience is finding it incredibly helpful as well, just to have a more complete understanding of what resources are available and the way the local and the federal interact with one another. Thank you, that was very, very helpful. I wanna to turn to a question about democracy education, civic education. We at AJC are really concerned about the overlap, which I'm sure you see as well, between anti-Semitism and the fraying of liberal democratic values that are going on in America right now. We live in an era, I know I don't need to tell you or our audience, of ever-increasing polarization, of the siloing of people into different separate groups that don't talk to each other, the lack of fact-based inquiry, rising conspiratorial thinking on the right, on the left, in so many places, all of which create really, unfortunately, fertile soil for the growth of anti-Semitism and at the same time, really deeply impact our ability to thrive as a pluralistic democracy. And I know you share with us the belief that educational spaces have to be part of the solution to these very, very big and very thorny problems. How is the Department of Education addressing kind of those big issues that are not gonna be solved this year or next year, but may take five, 10, 15 years to actually solve. I go back to, again, my roots of a teacher, like talk about, well, I worked in an inner city school for 10 years with students, 100% of students identified um, as re, uh, qualifying for a free or reduced lunch, every risk factor known to education. And I love big thorny issues that can't be solved in a day. And yet, and what it taught me is that you have to work with two competing things at the same time, with urgency and with patience. And if you're, if you're patient and you just wait for it to be perfect before you get it right, you're wrong. And if you go too urgent, you go too, you go too quickly, you leave some people behind. So I'm gonna frame that, that's the personal uh, stance that I bring to it. And then I think about the work that President Biden has been leading. President Biden has spoken about this topic. He has spoken about the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. And he talked about how anti-Semitic chants that he heard that day ultimately drove and motivated him to run for president. When I think about the framing in the context of the time that we're in and what really needs to happen to move past the ever increasing pol pol polarization and siloing, this lack of fact-based inquiry, how do you actually get underneath that? We're each driven in our desire to serve and to serve in multiple viewpoints and from multiple perspectives. But we have to understand that from this perspective of how what is this overlap of anti-Semitism that's fraying the liberal, the liberal democratic values? Let's lean into that. We know that while anti-Semitism most directly and intensely affects the American Jewish community. Let's be clear, anti-Semitism also threatens our very democracy, our values, our safety, and the rights of all Americans. We can't forget that. We have to be very clear-eyed about this. And that is what leads us to action, and action around enforcement, action around support. And when we break down the persistent characteristics of anti-Semitism, not just today and in this moment and in 2017, but the persistent characteristics of anti-Semitism that have been in, in existence throughout history. There's this idea that Jews have too much privilege or too much power. So it's at the root of this. And so put that in the forms of all kinds of hate, 
numerous forms of hate. Anti-Semitism is intended to divide Americans. And it's doing it by scapegoating certain people, eroding our trust in government and in social institutions, and thereby it's threatening our democracy and thereby it's undermining our core values of freedom, unity, and decency. When I you put that in that context and you understand where we are and why this is so important, not just as a moment thing, but in history, past, present, and what the, where we could go in the future if we truly understand what this means. That's why I am such, I, I think it's so important we keep going back to the national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. That came out, remember what I said in the opening, before October 7th. We weren't waiting to react to something that happened and then come up with the national strategy to counter it. We knew this was so important to this administration. That's why this administration released it. Countering anti-Semitism is core to protecting the entire democracy. And it's a key part of countering, I think a key part of countering anti-Semitism is creating places and spaces where we can increase awareness and understanding about what it actually is and what it isn't. And so that's why we launched the anti-Semitism awareness campaign. That's why we're spotlighting the long-term efforts that are happening in schools across the country, not the immediate and in the moment reactions, but long-term efforts being spotlighted. And that's why we're proud of the fact that everything we're doing as an administration is not about the impact that we can have in, in just four years. It's about the impact that we can have for generations. That's what teachers do. Teachers teach because they know you have that one year to teach that student and then they graduate and they move on. And sometimes they come back. I was just this morning having a text conversation with one of my students from my first year of teaching. She is now a teacher. She's wow. She is in her late thirties. I can't believe it. She's like older now than I was when I was teaching her. I was 21 years old, fresh out of college, and she was seven years old. Her mother was my principal at the day. They just recently passed away. She's my lifelong mentor. And to know that Anna is now a teacher, the impact is, is I had Anna for a year. But over 30 years later, we are still talking about what we learn, what we share, what we think, what we believe. So Democracy matters and it's built on relationships. It's built on understanding, not othering people, knowing where people come from and building that common understanding about how to move forward. And there, are, there is a national strategy to counter anti-Semitism and it's at the core of preserving our democracy and how we work together in a human humanistic way. I'm so inspired by what you just said. It so coheres with the way that I see and the way AJC sees the role of education. And it just feels incredibly important to have partners in government who think that way. Um, it makes this era of Jewish history very different than any other era uh, of Jewish history. Um, and we're very, very grateful for that. Um, with this note, uh, this moment, um, we have so many questions coming in from our audience that I think I'm going to turn things over to Claire, who's going to ask some questions from the audience. Claire, I'm turning it to you. Thank you, Laura. Um, our first question is coming from several people on Zoom who are asking, how can Jewish parents and communities partner with the Department of Education in its work of confronting anti-Semitism? Well, thank you for that question. And also, Claire, thank you for monitor monitoring all of this because Laura and I are like deep in this conversation. So it's good to have you helping to monitor. I think that, um, first of all, partnering is always like, it should be our middle name because that's what we love to do. If you've ever heard the secretary talk, he talks about partnership and intentional collaboration. Here's what I would say is our resources are only as useful as if people know about them and i'll tell you an example my what the first seven years i taught at beth israel day school the assistant rabbi there was a woman named rabbi koski Lori koski who's a lifelong friend of mine she now works in san diego as a, a assistant chancellor at the community college she was in washington dc for something with the community colleges recently and she was sharing with me what the community college in san diego was trying to figure out in terms of addressing what they were seeing happening on campus 
And I said, Lori, check out our website. Let me show you what we have. And I pulled out my phone and I showed her the landing page that we put out. And this was a year ago, what we or a little less than a year ago, what we had put together in terms of supports and resources. And she was like, oh my God, I can't wait to go back and show this to the chancellor and the team. And her reaction was sort of like, I never imagined going to the Department of Education website to get a resource that would be helpful in the middle of something we're facing right now. That is a typical sentiment. People don't think, I didn't. I will admit when I was superintendent, the Department of Ed website wasn't the or teacher or principal. I didn't think to go there. But now, I mean, let's just think about the fact that the Department of Education, thanks to the Biden-Harris administration, is being run by teachers. We'll just pause on that for a moment. It hasn't always been run by teachers. It's run by teachers in this administration. The secretary is a teacher. I'm a teacher. We have most of our appointees have worked in the classroom and have vast experience. So our resources, in terms of partnering with us and how do we work on confronting anti-Semitism, like we rely on parents and communities who work closely and have the relationships with schools on the ground to let them know that there's guidance that could be applicable to them. Parents and community members, you can let them know there are enforcement things they should know about because they don't want to get caught up in something that's going to turn into a compliance review or investigation. But you also can point them to the resources that we have available that will make sure you have access to them. So you can be our very best advocates of putting it out there saying, be the did you know and, and send it along to campus leaders and administrators that you have the relationships with. I don't have the relationships across the country. I have the relationships that I have in my beloved community. And I was able to share that with a community member that I know when I talk to her. But you do that with all of your deep connections and networks that you have that are so valuable. Let them know what we have available. And then we're in a constant iterative loop on when people give us feedback, we put it out there, they give us feedback, then we up it and we change things and we put more out or put less out, more of this, less of that. So just keep it moving and then the help, let them know that these might be applicable and helpful to them and give us feedback if they need more or something different. I think it's such a great, it's such an important answer. And I know that we also rely so much on our parents and our students out there to share our resources as well, which are really developed so much in keeping with the national strategy. Um, you are the ones who have those relationships, you all out there, you have the close relationships with the teachers, administrators, educators in your communities who are educating your children who are educating you. Um, and I, I just want to underscore exactly uh, uh, what Deputy Secretary Martin has to say about that. Back to you, Claire. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lindsay Silverberg, who's asking, aside from Title VI investigations, are there other ways that the department is thinking about that the department is thinking about to keep educational institutions accountable for lack of action in combating anti-Semitism? Back to the enforcement arm and that we're fierce about that. Our Office for Civil Rights really is our best means of holding educational institutions accountable for violations. When there are violations of civil rights, including on the basis of shared ancestry, such as Jewish ancestry, that's what our office does. And then we also have things like equity assistance centers that are available to any school and district in the country, and it can help schools. The, the way I look at it is, I mean, I just talked about the five resolution agreements that that Office for Civil Rights has just secured in recent months. Um, those are the cautionary tales to universities and leaders to say, do you need to get yourself into a situation where you're being investigated and you have to enter into a resolution agreement with the Office for Civil Rights to get on track to be on the right side of the law in history? And do you need to wait for that? Read those five resolution agreements and you'll see what, what they're agreeing to are things that you could actually put in place right now and not wait until you get some sort of resolution agreement that you're mandated to put in place. Follow the law. And if you're not sure how to follow the law and you think you are, but you find yourself on the wrong side here and it's nuanced sometimes, and you're going to get one advice from your general counsel, a different advice from your school campus security officers and different advice from student unions and different advice from community members. I want to point people to the equity assistance centers. Those are available to every district to ask the questions when you're confused, you turn right, you make some people mad, you turn left, you make some people mad, you go straight and you might be on the right side of the law, but you have ever been mad on either side, but you need to know you've just followed the law and how do you communicate it? Like we can help with that. And this can prevent them 
from ever needing to be investigated in the first place. Thank you. Our next question comes from David Goldman, who's asking, how do you collaborate with other federal agencies and committees like the Department of Justice or the House Education and Workforce Committee, for example? And what about with state and local governments? Well, I outlined a little bit about how our new guidance just came out through our collaboration with the other federal agencies like Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, and then our collaboration with House and Ed, House Ed and Workforce Committee. That all that collaboration is the cornerstone of what we do. We we can't exist in a silo in how we do this work. So what happens is the laws that are passed by Congress we readily implement, and with the budget that Congress gives us, we can talk about if it's enough budget or not budget. But that's not what this meeting is about. We readily implement the laws that are passed by Congress, and we do it with the budget that Congress gives us. Our current budget request, I will be clear, for the Office for Civil Rights is not what has been passed by Congress. So we're always eager for greater support to keep pace with the growing demand. And we've been very, our secretary has been clear in our budget request and AJC is very well aware of all of that. But we also work very closely with other federal agencies, like I mentioned, for example, that webinar that we just had with the Department of Justice and Homeland Security that was specifically focused on campus safety, which by the way, came from these regular cadence of meetings that I have with stakeholders across the field saying we need to have more information on campus safety. And so that webinar was direct response to what we've been hearing from the field. And we, you know, it was for, it was for campus, it was about campus safety, but it was for both the leaders of the higher, higher ed institutions and for campus public safety officers so that people had real time information from multiple federal agencies all working together. So a campus leader didn't have to go to three different webinars, one with DOJ, one with DHS, one with Ed, and then try to piece it all together. We did it as a one webinar. Our secretary kicked it off. The second gentleman was there. There were speakers from each agency, and then there were resources put out afterwards. So it was a clear and coherent approach and a one-stop shop for people to know how to improve campus safety and respond to difficult circumstances that we have all over campuses. More than difficult, but we all know what we're facing. Our next question came over email and is asking, there are different, there are types of anti-Semitism that are easy to define and others, especially those that overlap with anti-Zionism that are harder to define. How does the department define anti-Semitism? An easy well, question for you. <laughs> am I going to write a dissertation here? Like, let's... <laughs> the U.S. national strategy for countering anti-Semitism is very clear. And it's a good resource to go back to. And I want that to be at the front of the mind for everybody. That document that came out, like I keep saying, before October 7th should not be sitting on anyone's shelf collecting dust because these are tough questions and they're, nobody pretends to have the ultimate answer. It's a matter of opinion and perspective and history and context. All of that gets put together. But in that document, in the U.S. National Strategy for Counting Anti-Semitism document, we welcomed several definitions of anti-Semitism, which serve for us to use as a valuable tool so we can raise awareness and we can increase understanding of anti-Semitism. Our Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights does consider the working definition of anti-Semitism of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IRA. So the national strategy also made clear that Jewish students Jewish educators, administrators are sometimes discriminated against because of their actual or perceived views on Israel. And we want to be clear that all students should feel safe and be free from violence, harassment, and intimidation on their campuses. Our last question before I turn it back to you, Laura, is we're all in agreement that this is a very challenging time to be in educational spaces, whether as a student, administrator, or faculty member. But is there anything that's giving you hope in your work at this moment? I mean, I think teachers always have it built into our DNA to always have hope. Teaching is always an act of, of faith. You pour into a student for a year and then send them off to the next year's teacher, the next year's teacher, and off to go and live their dream. And so my hope always comes from that idea of wholehearted engagement, authenticity, and the human response to difficult situations where we come together in conversation and have joy 
be at the center of tough things that we do. I was on a call with students, which I try to do as often as possible. And one of the things students said the other day, they're kind of going around the around the Zoom room, as it were, and a question was asked sort of, sort of like this, what gives you hope? And this, this is a smaller group and there were people from different generations on there. And what happened was one of the more senior members of the group says, you know, what gives me hope is you, the young people. And there was a lot of young people on the call. And one brave young woman spoke up after that very respectfully and said, you know, I'm glad that the, us, the younger generation gives you hope, but that sometimes makes me mad when I hear you say that because you left us a mess and now we got to clean it up. You're, all your hope is in us. Do it with us. <laughs> so I thought, woo, she was making it spicy. Uh, but I get it. I get what she's saying. Like, are we in community? Are we working together? Are we listening to different viewpoints and perspectives? And are we bringing joy into every conversation that we have, even when it's hard? And the human capacity to hold great sadness, fear, and worry at the same time with great joy is immense. We can do that. We are able to hold both. And, and sometimes two things can be true at once. And so that's what gives always gives me hope is creating spaces where people's voices can be heard, where education can occur, where learning happens. And there's a difference between teaching and learning. A lot of people, you know, teachers are great, but you got to make sure people are learning and learning happens in the safe spaces that we create. And we create those spaces through rigorous enforcement when necessary, appropriate funding always, and ongoing teaching and learning for the adults, the communities, and the students that we care so much about. Thank you so much, Deputy Secretary, Secretary Cindy Martin. We were talking earlier about how your title is a, as a mouthful and a, I just tripped over it. So it's too many Cindy. syllables. <laughs> yes, thank, you. Um, thank you so much. Our really our great thanks for joining us this morning for this incredibly important conversation. We at AGC and I know the Jewish community as a whole is very grateful to you and to the Department of Education as a whole for all the work that you're doing for enforcing policies that act really as critical deterrence against anti-Semitism in our educational institutions. And we really see every day your commitment and the Department of Education's commitment to keeping Jewish students included and safe in school spaces. So thank you. I'm gonna turn it back to Claire. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Martin, for today's timely and insightful conversation. And thank you to our global audience for tuning in today. For more information, including resources for students, action items for administrators, and ways you can get involved, visit our resource hub at ajc.org slash Center for Education Advocacy. Thank you again, and goodbye.